Lucas was very kind and he gave me the topic of worry about a month before my wedding. Um, so as you can imagine, it's quite a, um, a busy time for me, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so this topic was, is challenging in, in, in more, more ways than one. Um, also, I'm very cognizant that, that worry is something that almost everybody struggles with a little bit, but some people really struggle with it more, more, more acutely than others. Um, and sometimes simply telling them not to worry um, is, is kind of, it's almost too simplistic, you know? Um, and, and so I really feel the weight of trying to be sensitive to this, you know, the, the fact that actually for some people it doesn't feel like something they can control. It's not something they feel they can, they can change. And telling them don't worry is, is almost too casual. Um, and, and so I want to be sensitive and loving to those people who feel like this is just something that, that happens, it's not something they control. Um, so just for those people out there, I don't think worrying is about lack of faith, and I don't think worrying is a sin. Um, I think sometimes the underlying sinfulness of, of human, pe human people and of the fallen world causes us to worry. And I think it's important um, to, to remind you that we live in a fallen world. Um, we are, we're not designed to worry. Um, God does not intend us to worry. We face fears and, 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 and horrendous things outside of our um, experience and understanding um, because of the fall that result in us worrying. Um, so I think, in, in a sense also, there's, there's, there's an aspect of, of, of this psychological, uh, sorry, physiological effects of, of, of worrying. Um, <laughs> Gary is completely distracting me. Excuse me while you know, he sits down. <laughs> um, um, so it's interesting because they've done experiments with people um, where, they, where they stimulate parts of the brain um, with, with electric pulses and such things, and it, it either increases or reduces anxiety. So there clearly is sort of physical responses about anxiety. Um, also, a panic attack is quite a, 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 a very intense thing. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's almost like you feel like you're going to die. Um, and once you've had one, it compounds your anxiety because you, you fear having another one. Um, and there are legitimate medical conditions that can cause anxiety. Um, so by all means, if you're feeling acute anxiety, go see a doctor. Um, also, drugs are there to help. So, you know, some, some, some medication out there can help anxiety. But I want to explore a couple of ideas today um, that I think may, may give us a, a, a window into what worry is and what, what anxiety is all about. Um, and just to remind you that, that God wants to take our worries. It says in 1 Peter 5, Cast all your cares upon him, for, for, for he cares for you. He, he loves you. He doesn't want you to worry about things. And, and he wants to take those things from you because he's, he's able to control the things you're not, not able to control. Also, anxiety robs us of the fullness of life. So, the first of this, the, these concepts that I want to explore is, is about the order of our loves. So, if we go on to the next slide. Um, Augustine talks about how we, we tend to love things in disorder, and that is, some, is the root of our problem. Um, a very interesting idea. Um, and so what I want to explore today is the, the idea of, of what is the structure of our heart? How do we love things? Um, and I think our hearts are structured very much like the tabernacle and the temple. You know, if you remember the, the, the Old Testament tabernacle was, was structured in, in the outer courts and then the inner courts and then the holy place, and then the holy of holies. Mm -hmm. And I think our hearts are the same. Um, we have things that are really, really core and central to who we are, and they give us meaning and significance. And those are the things that we put in our holy of holies. Those are the main things. Now, my contention today is that actually, the thing in the holy of holies can only be God. Yes. He is the only thing that can give you complete meaning and significance. He's the only thing that is above us and beyond us, eternal creator of the universe who knows exactly how you were designed and exactly what you need. Excuse me. And the things on the outside are important and they're good things, but they're not the main thing. And it's when, when things from the, the holy place, 
and the inner courts and the outer courts sort of creep into the holy place and the holy of holies, that things start to go awry. Um, and, and the Bible talks about um, idolatry. It's when, it's when the main thing isn't the main thing anymore. So I've got some circles up there, and there's a very simplistic picture about the, the, sort of the, 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 the structure of our hearts. But I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about what is it that we've made the main thing in our lives? What is that thing that we've got in the Holy of Holies? And is it God? Are we substituting God with God's substitutes? Because if God's substitute is something we put in our Holy of Holies, because it does, to some degree, give us meaning and significance. But it's a temporary thing. It's, it's not something that can always give us meaning and significance. It will fail you. Um, and sometimes we put those things in there because we want to avoid God as he really is. Because God, he's not controllable. He's, he's out there, he's big, he's sometimes quite scary. Um, and to put him in the center of your heart is something, sometimes quite a, <laughs> it's a risk. <laughs> um, but I would, I would say today, um, it is a risk worth taking. Um, go on to the next slide, let's have a look. Yeah. So the idea of idolatry is that we put something that isn't the main thing as the main thing. And what I think that does is it takes the axis of the wheel of our lives and puts it off center. So if you have a look at the picture on the, on the, on the screen, um, that is, they call it a clown's bicycle. So the axis is off center. And you can imagine when you're steering on a bicycle like that, you do this, right? And when life gets really, really hectic, you're doing this. And, and it gets really, really crazy. Um, and, and things just don't feel right. It's not, it's not helpful. Um, and idolatry is, is, is really, the Old Testament is so strong on idolatry. And it's interesting because that carries through into the New Testament. The, the Revelation talks about the idolaters will not enter the kingdom of, the kingdom of God. It's, 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 a, it's a scary thing. Um, and I think idolatry is so damaging to us, and that's why God is so um, against it. Because it hurts us. It robs us of full, fullness of joy. It robs us of fullness of life. Um, now, it's interesting because... The things we put as the main thing are not necessarily bad things in, the, in and of themselves. They're either good things, like, um, for instance, your spouse. It's a good thing. You know, you love him or her. Um, a wedding. I'm going to have a wedding in, the, in a month. It's a good thing, you know. If I put that at the center, things go awry. Um, it can be a neutral thing. Your health, it's a fairly neutral thing. Um, your age, you yeah. um, know. Money. It's neutral, I think. But if you put it at the center of your heart, it can become very destructive. Um, or it can actually be a bad thing. If, if, if you've got an illicit relationship with somebody, that's not a good thing. Yeah. But if that, that's at your center of your heart, it'll cause huge amount of damage and destruction to those around you. Um, the other thought I had was revenge. If, 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 if the one thing that is really at the core of you is you're seeking to have revenge for something that is done to you, that will eat you up inside. It's a terrible thing. And, and a lot of these things, or all of these things, as I said already, are temporary. They're limited. Um, they cannot compete with the eternal God. Um, and the interesting thing is that idols cannot stand in the presence of God. There's a very interesting story in 1 Samuel 5 about um, the Philistines um, were, I think it's the Philistines, were, were com um, fighting against Israel, and they saw that Israel had this ark. So they think, oh, this is this magical device that makes, makes the gods smile on them, yeah. so we're going to steal it. So they steal it, and of course everything goes horribly wrong because it's, you know, it's the ark of the covenant that, that carries the presence of God. Um, and so they bring it into their temple of their god Dagon. Um, and the first night, um, Dagon basically just falls in, on his face in front of the ark of the covenant. Um, so basic thing is that an idol cannot stand in the presence of God. The second night, they put Dagon back up, you know, oh, he fell over, it must have been the wind or something. Yeah. Um, the second night, he falls over again, and this time he breaks off his head and his hands. Your idols cannot, cannot control anything in the presence of God, and they cannot have any actions or, 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 or hands um, in his presence. So one of the ways to disarm your idols 
is to put them in the presence of God. Um, the other thing about um, idols, and I'm just going to read to you out of Isaiah 44, um, from verse 12 to 20. The blacksmith takes a tool and works it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures a, with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it out with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dw dwell in, in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps um, took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It was used for fuel, for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns with fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his full. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm, I see the fire. For the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to worship it. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. Their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has knowledge or understanding to say. Half of it I use for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals and roasted meat and ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from that what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? So the one thing I wanted to pull out of this, this passage was the fact that it's a lie, it's a deception. You, you sometimes put something as the main thing, believing that it's going to give you meaning and significance, and it's a lie, yeah. it's a deception. And we all know where lies come from, right? So again, don't be, don't be unaware that we have an enemy who wants you to have something that cannot see, cannot understand, cannot hear, cannot help you to be the main thing in your heart. The other concept I want to touch on is our relationship with time. Now you're probably thinking, what on earth has this got to do with idols? But I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and what has that got to do with worry as well? But I'll get to that as well. Um, <laughs> Time is a very interesting thing, um, and as a scientist, I quite, quite like the concept of time. It's quite a, a mind-bendy, twisty thing. There's a lot of great films out there that, that, that deal with the concept of time. Sliding Doors is one of my ultimate favorites, but I also like things like 12 Monkeys, and I'm showing my age by the type of movies I like. Um, <laughs> but it really is um, a fascinating thing. What is time? And if you think about it, we only experience time in the now. So, you only live now. Our relationship with the past is only through our memory. And our relationship with our future is through the possibilities that might come. Now, God has given us this amazing gift of time to be experienced in the now. Yeah. And only God experiences time any differently from that. So, so we've got these, these three ideas that the past as past memories, the present as the present moment, and then the future as future possibilities. Now my contention is that, that idols change the way we approach time and it robs us of all sort of fullness um, and, and joy. If you go to the next slide. Um, so in the, in, the, in the past memories, because our idols have failed us, we remember those failures and we feel shame. So our, 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 our past is tainted by the failure of our idols. The future is also tainted by a fact that when we see in the future something that threatens that thing that we hold most dear, something like 
if you're scared of growing old, right, what is it that you're holding most dear? It's that thing that, that, that I'm young and I'm full of energy and I'm, I, you know, life is good right now and I'm scared that that'll change. It's because the most, the close, the main thing there is, is your, 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 um, your self-image or your, your image of yourself as now. Um, and the, the prospect of getting old threatens that. So that leads to an anxiety. Now, I'm going to give you a few more examples of that in a little bit. But, but I think that anxiety is something that is, is all-consuming because if you've got lots of things that you're holding most dear, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the future that will threaten that. Um, and so either the present moment is filled with memories of past shame or it's obsessed with the worries of future possibilities. Or if you've got an idol sitting as the main thing, the present moment, when the idol isn't giving you meaning and significance, it feels like everything is meaningless and insignificant and you're just bored. So your experience of time is undermined by the thing that you've got as the main thing. Now, that's it's quite abstract, and I, and I realize you probably need to, to chew over that a little bit. But what I want to focus on a little bit is the fact that um, if, if we have something as the main thing in our, in our hearts that isn't God, that's a God substitute, and something threatens that, we'll worry about it. So let, let's work out a really simple and quite a fun example, um, just because it's, it's possible. So if I have the perfect wedding as my main thing, if I've been dreaming about this perfect wedding all my life, and that's, and that's, that's the thing that is, is going to make me the most happy, and if the day is not perfect, I am going to be absolutely miserable, all the possibilities that things could go wrong on the day will cause me anxiety. So I'd be worried about the weather. What if it rains? Oh no, it's going to be terrible. Or, you know, what if the florist doesn't deliver the flowers on time? Or what if the florist doesn't deliver the right flowers? Or what if the flowers are not the right color? Or, you know, and you, and you start to think, oh my word, that's just ridiculous. Why are you worrying about such a trivial thing? But it's because the perfect day, I've put that from the outer courts right into the Holy of Holies. And that has now become the main thing. And you see people who do this all the time, right? They make a huge fuss about something that seems so insignificant. And we worry about things sometimes that are insignificant. Things that are just, you think, why? And it's because we've taken something from the outer circles and we've pushed them into the inner circle. And maybe we haven't done that consciously. Um, so let's go back to Matthew 6. And let's just see if I've been talking off the top of my head or if this is actually in the scriptures because I need to check that sometimes. So I'm going to read it again. But this time, I'm going to read it from verse 24. Um, and it's interesting because it, so the Sermon on the Mount is a, is a whole sermon and it does tend to flow together. So from verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, 
Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So in that passage, it's contrasting two main things. It's contrasting God as the main thing, his kingdom and his righteousness as the central, central part in our hearts, versus money as the main thing. And if you, if, if you look at money as the main thing, it will give you meaning and significance in, in the extent to the things of what it buys. But money is limited. It's temporary. It, it, it cannot compete with God. And there's a future possibility that that money will run out, right? And then you, you won't have food that you like or clothes that you want. And so God is saying, don't worry about the clothes and the food, right? Because <laughs> that future possibility, he's got it, right? So there are still things in the outer circles that, m that might concern you. But if, if, if God is at the center and you're seeking first his righteousness and his kingdom, he will take care of the peripheral things, right? He knows that you need them. Um, and, and it's interesting because if, if money is at the center, those, that thing drives your thoughts and behaviors. You're, God talks about, you know, the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns. You know, it's, that, it's the thing that, oh, we must sow and reap and store away in barns. That, that's that's the, the drive behind it because otherwise we will run out. Um, and in terms of the clothes, labor and spin, you know, it's, it's those things that drive you. And if you're feeling driven in your life, just check what's the main thing. Because God is not a slave driver. Yeah. The scriptures talk about that you're a slave to that which you obey. And it's, it's those things that, that drive you which tend to be the, the misplaced God substitutes in our hearts. Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the thing is about putting God in the center of our hearts. I don't think it's something that, that we can do. <laughs> and maybe that sounds contradictory. But... The thing is, right, I think Jesus understands anxiety. We have a high priest who has experienced all the things that we have. So if you've experienced anxiety, has Jesus experienced it as well? Now, my contention is that, that, that idols, so the main thing, the, the threat to that main thing in the future causes anxiety. So does that mean Jesus had an idol in his heart? I, I don't think so. I think the central thing in Jesus' heart was his relationship with the Father, right? And there was an instance in his walk where that, that relationship was threatened. And if you think about the agony of Gethsemane, He's, he's in that garden, and he is praying, God, take this away. I don't want to be separated from you. My, my, the most precious thing for me is to be with you. I don't want that to be taken away. But not my will. Yours be done, right? Jesus, I, it's, it's a bit of a guess, but I think he probably had a panic attack. He was sweating blood. He was distressed. He was in agony. He was terrified. But that didn't stop him because, because he knew that if he let go of the most important thing, the main thing, that would open up the way for us to let God be the main thing, right? Because in that moment when he died, the veil was torn so that Jesus could enter into the Holy of Holies within our hearts. The things that separated us from God could be pushed aside, yes. right? So that the Holy Spirit can enter in and stand at the center of your heart and make all your idols fall to the ground, right? And it's not what, what we do. It's not about our efforts. It's not about going, God, I'm going to make you the center. God, I'm going to make you the center. God, please be the center. No. He's already done it, yeah. right? 
So look at the cross and say, Lord, here are my worries. Here are my, my anxieties. Be the center. And he's done it. He's already done it. So at the cross we say, leave the shame of my past because all my sins in the past, all my failed idols are washed by your blood. And I leave the cares and worries and anxieties because he has conquered everything, even death. And he works all things to the good. And we can boldly approach the throne of grace because he has opened the way. And the most exciting thing the most amazing thing is that our hearts are literally his temple. Yeah. We are his body. <laughs> it, it, it blows my mind every time I think about this. We are a living, living stones built together so that Jesus can live within us. And it's all through his grace. Now, there are three spiritual disciplines that I think help us to get to that place of just coming to the cross. Um, and I'm going to just really, really briefly just run through them. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish with the scripture. But the first is solitude. The, the thing with, with the stuff on the outer circles is that it tends to be quite loud and it tends to be quite busy and frantic and screaming for your attention the whole time. Um, and I, I'm just reminded of Elijah after he's had that incredible battle on, 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 on the, the Mount Carmel with, with, the, the, with the prophets of Baal. He runs off because everything was just so crazy and he's, he's got, had this threat from, from Jezebel. Um, and when he encounters God, it's a very still, small voice. And my experience is that God doesn't shout for our attention. He really doesn't. He doesn't push to get, to get us to do stuff. He waits. He's the most patient person on the planet. Well, <laughs> the universe, he's beyond the planet. Um, but he's patient. Yeah. And he's a very still, small voice. So sometimes you need to step out of the frenetic stuff. Sometimes you need to go away from the people you love and take some time out on your own just to let your mind drift and wander and to reflect on what God has done. The second thing um, that I want to touch on is, is meditation. Oh, before I step off solitude, Jesus did it all the time. So if Jesus did it, good idea, you should do it. Um, the second one is meditation. Now, when I was, I was thinking of a worry, um, the actual mechanic of worry is quite an interesting thing. It's your, your thoughts going round and round and round and round and round about a certain thing. And it's the thing that's sort of eating you up inside. Um, meditation is a similar mechanic. It's making your brain go round and round on a certain truth, right? Um, so I think meditation is almost the antithesis of worry. It's reflecting on how great God is, how powerful he is, how in control he is of every situation. And if you wash yourself in that truth, regularly. I think it might help. Don't know whether it will, but I, I trust it will. I, and I know that the, the Word of God is, 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 is powerful and it divides to the, the, the bone and marrow. If you wash yourself in the Scripture, the Holy Spirit will change your heart. Um, and the final thing is, is Sabbath. And, and I think this is, is a, a topic all on its own. You know talk for months and months on Sabbath. Um, but I wanted to highlight Sabbath because, because in our experience of time, we only have the now. I think Sabbath is a moment to celebrate what God has done. And it's interesting, I've been reading through um, some of the, the, the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Bible. Um, and it's, some of it's heavy going, but some of it's really interesting. Um, and one thing that struck me recently was that um, the, the command to gather together three times a year for a holy convocation, sort of a, a holy Sabbath where you will do no work, um, it's for a joyful thing. It's a celebration. And I think that's when 
in the present moment, you can really live? When you can feel God's breath in your lungs, when you're not obsessed with worry for the future, when you're not worried about your past, past shame, when you can live in this moment and find your significance and meaning um, with God and, and live in the gifts of this, of this just this, this time. And I think Sabbath is something that we see as something quite negative. You know, um, it's quite legalistic sometimes in our, in our minds. Um, and, and I think that's, that's not the way that God intended. It's supposed to be a joyous thing. Um, and I think there's, there's a very interesting passage in Hebrews that talks about entering his rest. And I think that it's a gift. Um, so I don't want don't to dwell on it too much, but have a ponder about Sabbath. Take a day off. Um, and bear in mind, rest is not the same as pursuit of leisure. So, you know, going off for a theme park is not necessarily rest. It's good, but it's not rest. Um, yeah. So to end, I'm just going to read Philippians, um, which is also a very famous passage about worry. And I'd encourage you to read pretty much all of Philippians, because I think it, Paul touches on some of, some of the ideas of, of what is central um, in his heart um, earlier on in the book. Um, but I'm just going to end in Philippians 4, um, from verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Lord Jesus, thank you that you enabled us to put you at the center of our hearts. And we pray, Lord Jesus, if there's anything there at the moment that is not, that is not you, <laughs> will you take it away, Lord? And Father, we lift up to you all those things that worry us, all those things that in the future seem scary, and uncontrollable. Father God, we know that you care for us. And therefore we cast all these things at your feet, Lord Jesus, and give them to you. Be with us, we pray.